Hello everybody, I'm Nick and in this video I'm going to show you a very nice and neat way to structure your minimal APIs in .NET by using a library called Fast Endpoints. Now Fast Endpoints, which by the way is a great library and I highly recommend you go and give a star on GitHub, the link is in the description, is a library that is fairly opinionated, especially when it comes to validation, mapping and versioning. However, I don't think that this is a bad thing. I think the choices made in here are good. So without any further ado, let's see exactly what this library has to offer. If you like the content and you want to see more, make sure you subscribe, earning the notification bell and for more training, check out nickchapsas.com. And speaking of nickchapsas.com, I want to let you know that I just launched my brand new course all about minimal APIs. It is a from zero to hero course, meaning I take you from the very basics and I'm showing you extension points and best practices. And then I'm showing you how you can structure your minimal API in a very nice and clean and elegant way. And then I'm showing you how you can test it and make sure it's safe to push to production. With Microsoft themselves saying that they expect 80 to 90% of all the new APIs to be built with minimal APIs and all the effort in .NET 7 when it comes down to the API world to be focused on minimal APIs, they won't go anywhere. Invest early in your knowledge in them because they will only become more and more prevalent. And interestingly enough, what you're going to see in this video is a byproduct of minimal APIs. That's what they can make possible. I highly recommend you check it out. And to celebrate the launch, I want to offer the first 100 of you a 15% off using coupon code MINIMAL15. So check it out and thank you very much for supporting the channel. Back to the video. So what I have here is an empty console application. It doesn't have anything. I literally just created an empty console app. So what I want to do is I'm going to go here and say fast endpoints. And I'm going to search for a fast endpoints um, NuGet package. And I'm going to use the first one over here. So I'm going to go ahead and import it in the project. And now the first thing I want to do is I'm going to change that to actually be a web project. So I'm going to go into the top level here and I'm going to say sdk.web and this will add all the necessary imports for this to be run as an API effectively. So the first thing we need for any minimal API is your builder. So builder equals um, web application dot create builder. And then we want to say builder dot services dot add fast endpoints. Here we go. And then we're going to create an app out of this. So it goes builder dot build. Here we go. And then app.run is when the thing actually runs, but we can say app.authorization and app.use fast endpoints. Here we go. So that's all we need to have here. And I'm going to go ahead and create my first endpoint. So I'm going to say example endpoint here. And the only thing I need to do is say endpoint without request. In this case, we don't really have a request. It looks like this. We have to implement a couple of classes here. So here we go. And then we have a configure method and a handle method. In the configure method, we have to configure what this endpoint looks like. So this is, and we can have verbs. So this is a get endpoint. We could also use the get method, but let's just use the verbs one. And then we can say that the routes for this endpoint is just example, just that. And we're going to allow anonymous for this. That's, that's all there is to it. And then here, all I have to say, I'm going to turn this into an async, is await send async. And we're going to have just um, a new object and say message equals hello world. And that's it. And we can pass down the cancellation token if we want. But this is everything we need to do. So if I go ahead and I run this and I go into Postman to call this API, if I go ahead and I call it, as you can see, I'm getting the call back. So this is now using minimal API technology behind the scenes to do all the necessary wiring. And I have a very clear class where everything about this endpoint lives here. And this is effectively implementing the request endpoint response pattern or ripper. <laughs> stupid, which might be familiar to you, especially if you're working with Mediator, where you have some request, some handling and some response. It's the same thing, but on the API level, but it's using minimal API technology. So it is on par in performance with minimal APIs, which are a lot faster than MVC controllers. This is a very simple example. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to recreate the same weather forecast API that MVC comes out with out of the box using fast endpoints and show you the basics of how it works. So what I've done off camera is I went ahead and I added the weather forecast model, which comes from the web API uh, boilerplate code. And I added a request to get the forecast for a given amount of days. 
and then a response object, which is the same object as my DTO over here, but without the calculation of the forecast, because it doesn't need to know how to do that. And then a model which has an enumerable of many weather forecasts when I'm getting the weather forecast for n amount of days. So let's go ahead and write that weather forecast endpoint in fast endpoints. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to create a new directory called endpoints. By the way, this approach really enables you to go with vertical slices in your API design and split things by feature. I'm not doing that here because I am effectively already in that weather vertical slice. So I am one level deep into my feature in this microservice API. So that's why I'm not doing it. But if you had a feature folder and then split by feature, let's say a bag, stock, product, whatever, that would be a great approach to follow. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say weather forecast endpoint here. So I have a class for my endpoint and I'm going to say this extends the endpoint class and then this accepts the request. So weather forecast request goes here and then weather forecasts response goes here. And that's it. And now all I need to do is implement those two missing members, the configure method and the handle async method. Here we go. So again, in the configure, I have to describe what this endpoint is, and I can do that by saying verbs. And this is again, a get endpoint. And you can have multiple routes for a given endpoint. You don't have to limit it to one. Uh, and we can say weather and then days. Here we go. Uh, and then we can also say allow anonymous because authorization is enabled by default here. So with that now out of the way, what I can do is turn this into a weather forecast retrieving application. So we have this, which is coming, if you remember, from the weather forecast example, the web API example, and then that code, and I am copying it from that old web API, um, allows you to get the weather forecast. So we get a range of one all the way to however many days the user provides through that request. And then we calculate a few random weather forecasts and we write them to the response. So await, send async forecasts, and for that, it needs to be mapped into a response. So the response is new weather forecasts response, which has a forecast object and it goes forecast.select. And let me just scroll down. Um, new weather forecast response. And then I'm effectively doing manual mapping here. So from a date to date, from a summary to summary, from a temperature uh, Celsius to a temperature Celsius, and from Fahrenheit to Fahrenheit. Here we go. And now if I return this here and I pass down the cancellation token, that's everything I need to do. And now I have my endpoint. So let's go ahead and run this API now and go to Postman again and call that. And let's get the weather for, let's say, five days of the week. And as you can see, five here. If I say um, one here, as you can see, I'm getting it for one. If I say two, I'm getting it for two. This is fully debuggable code. So if you actually need to step in here, you can. If I just run this in debug mode, as you can see, I'm calling this and it is stepping in here and I can get the weather, do anything I want and write the response back. So these are all the basics, but something that might not be obvious is how do you inject services in here? Let's say we want to have a private read-only iLogger to do some login in here and say weather forecast endpoint as the class and then logger and inject that from the constructor. So if I say here, logger.logdebug retrieving weather four days, days, and then the days count is in the request, so request days, here we go. So retrieving weather for n amount of days uh, is what I'm logging here. Now, if I go ahead and I debug this and I try to run this, it doesn't work. It doesn't know how to resolve this because the way it is being wired up behind the scenes doesn't know how to resolve things from the constructor. And that's one of the choices that I'm not a big fan of. However, there is an alternative. What you want to do is you want to change this a property and make it public. So public iLogger get init. And once you do that, you can go ahead and if I debug this now um, and I go ahead and I call it, you see that the logger is just magically resolved is here. What I don't like about this approach that the library author decided to take here is that there's a bit of magic here. Nothing explicitly says that this will be injected. I would prefer it if I could use maybe an inject attribute or something that makes it explicit. However, at least dependency injection works and you can test this if you want to. And with that, this is everything you need to build a nicely structured, very fast minimal API. But it doesn't stop here because the creator of the library has made 
two very interesting choices in mapping and validation that I want to show you now. So first, let's go with mapping. It is very common that whatever request you're exposing here or response you're exposing here is part of your API contract. And you don't change that because you don't want to make any breaking changes. So you have that contract, which is versioned. And then internally, you have your domain object, which is for me what I have in this models folder. This is a domain object. This is not exposed to the API. It is mapped to an API contract. So it's very common to have mapping between the two. So what I'm doing here, this is mapping effectively. Well, Fast Endpoints actually has mapping built into it. So let's see how we can use that. So I'm going to go here and say mappers and create a folder that contains my mappers. So I'm going to say new class weather forecast mapper. Here you go. And what I need for this is to extend the mapper class. And then this mapper class needs three things for me. The first thing that it needs is the request. So in my case, this is a weather forecast request over here. The second one is a response or weather forecast response over here. I'm explicitly not returning the one that says forecasts, and I will explain why in a second. But we're going to go with the forecast, the individual, the singular. Uh, and then we want to specify the entity which represents our domain object. Uh, in this case, it is the weather forecast over here. And that's all I need to have. And at this point, I'm going to go ahead and implement my mappers. This is where you might want to inject your own mapping if you're using AutoMapper or Mapster. Uh, in my case, I kind of prefer manual mapping because I like my mapping logic to be simple. So all I have to say is override. And because I am mapping from my domain object to an API contract, I'm going to say from entity. And there's also um, async overload, but I'm going to go with from entity. And I'm going to say return new weather forecast response. And that's going to be date to date, summary to summary, temperature Celsius to temperature Celsius, and then Fahrenheit to Fahrenheit. Here we go. And that's it. And now if I go back to my endpoint, all I need to do is I need to provide my mapper class. So weather forecast mapper goes here in that endpoint implementation. And now all I need to do is go back to this and say map dot from entity, which is what I uh, implemented. And in my case, it is the forecast. So I'm going to select on my array over here. So forecasts dot select. And all I'm going to say is map dot from entity. That's it. And this will now map to that object. And let's go ahead and see that in action. So if I put a breakpoint here and I run this API now, and I go ahead and call this endpoint, as you can see, we hit the endpoint. The mapper is now there. It points to the exact class that we just created. And if I step over this, my response is properly mapped, as you can see in these uh, two objects over here. So nice mapper implementation as part of the pipeline in a very nice and neat way. I like this. And it doesn't stop here because, for example, let's say that I can only provide the forecast for between 1 and 14 days. Anything after 14 days, I just can't because I don't have enough information to predict the weather. This means I want to validate on that request object and make sure the dates don't exceed 14 and are not less than 1. To do that, there's also another opinionated approach that fast endpoints take. Let's go ahead and create a validators folder. And in here, I'm going to create a weather forecast retrieval validator. Here we go. And all I need to do is extend the validator class. Here we go. And I need to specify what I want to validate. So my request object. In my case, it is the weather forecast request. That's it. And now you follow the fluent validation approach to write your validator. So constructor rule for a specific property. And I'm going to say for the days. So the days need to be greater than or equal to one with message in case of a failure that is weather forecast days must be at least one and then a second rule which is less than or equal to and that is 14 and the message is with message weather forecast can be retrieved past day 14 or past 14 days and that's it i don't need to be explicit about registering this anywhere if i go ahead and i debug this you will see that when i go ahead and i just call it it all works fine but if I go and say 15 days, for example, here, it automatically picked the validator up because it scanned it and it found it and it gives the appropriate error just by me doing nothing but using the library. It is really, really nice. I do think the library has some flaws on its API design. And when I mean API, I mean 
the actual C Sharp and .NET exposed to the user. But in principle, is a very nice and neat way to do things following what you will effectively see everywhere. You know, Fluent Validator, I see everywhere. Mapping logic from a contract or a domain, I see everywhere. I like that it doesn't use something like Mediator and just leaves you with a handle method to do whatever you want. But overall, I think it's a very nice and neat approach and it is using minimal APIs behind the scenes, which means you just gain all those benefits. So if you like this more minimalistic and targeted approach as opposed to a controller, this is for you. I personally don't really like controllers. I've said it in the past. I actually like the simplicity of minimal APIs. So to me, this approach looks very appealing. There's a few things I would like the author to fix, and I will make a video addressing those because I think it's a great learning exercise too for me to explain what questionable API design in a library looks like. But if those are ironed out, I'd be very happy to recommend this to everyone. Remember, this is an open source project. I highly recommend you click that link in the description and you give a star on GitHub. Open source creators are really struggling right now and they can get all the love we can give them. So please, if you like this, go ahead and give a star on GitHub. The last thing I want to show you, which is a very quick one, is if you're wondering how does this work with Swagger, there's actually a Swagger package over here where you can go ahead and add it to the project. And all you need to do is go here and say, uh, builder.services.addSwaggerDoc, that's it. And then go down here and say app, use Swagger UI3, and you can configure the defaults. So say, see configure defaults, and that's it. That's everything you need to do. And now if I go ahead and I run this, then it will not work because I did not add the open API call. So use open API here. But once I've done that, I can go here and then I can go to my browser. And as you can see now, Swagger works absolutely fine. I can open the weather section and have the days. Um, this appears to be a bug, but it works just fine. I can say four here and then execute it and it all works. I am getting what the uh, response looks like. And if I want to customize this in any way, then I can go back to that endpoint configure call and I can say describe and I can describe my endpoint. And I can say, for example, produces and I can say what the response looks like. So weather uh, forecasts response. And I can say that this returns a 200 status code with a given um, application uh, JSON content type. I have effectively full control of um, how I describe my API and then Swagger will pick it up and it will show the appropriate text in the API spec. Overall, I really like this package. Well, that's all I had for you for this video. Thank you very much for watching. Special thanks to my Patreons for making these videos possible. If you want to support me as well, you're going to find a link in the description down below. Leave a like if you like this video, subscribe for more content like this and ring the bell as well. And I'll see you in the next video. Keep coding.